Michael speaking. And we'll be monitoring questions in the chat box. So please type some in there uh, if you have any, and we'll bring them forward to Michael for a Q&A following the presentation. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, today we're being joined by Michael Brooks, uh, the CEO of Real PAC. And uh, that's the Senior Canadian Trade Association for Large Public and Institutional Investment Real Estate Companies. Real PAC published the first green lease in North America, brought the first corporate social responsibility standards to Canadian real estate companies, and has developed numerous industry guidance publications on sustainability and energy and carbon management. Michael is also a former adjunct professor and executive in residence at the Ted Rogers School of Management at Ryerson University and a former commercial real estate lawyer. He's represented the Canadian real estate industry in all major policy initiatives with governments at all levels. Uh, he's one of three business advisors to the Federal Government's Sustainable Development Advisory Council, special advisor to the United Nations Environment Program Finance Initiative Property Working Group, a former member of the Global Reporting Initiative's Construction and Real Estate Sector Supplement Team, and a former director and treasurer of the Canada Green Building Council. Michael is also the author of Canadian Commercial Real Estate Theory, Practice, Strategy, the first national textbook of its kind in Canada. So once again, welcome to everyone in our audience. And uh, Michael, we'll give you the digital floor. Great. Thanks very much, Evan. And uh, thanks to Carbon 613 and uh, Enviro Center for hosting me. <clears throat> and uh, I see a few familiar faces in the audience. Uh, and I'd like to say hello to James and uh, other colleagues um, from time to time. I was up in October speaking at one of James' events, and uh, it's always great to get up to Ottawa. Um, just some great people up there, some great thought leadership up there, and uh, love the city uh, as well. Uh, a little jealous of the fact that you can go across the river if they let you, and you can go cycling in the hills and, uh, and go on the hiking trails, but I'm in flatland country. So, um, I've been given about 30 minutes um, to talk about um, RealPAC, what we're doing, what the priorities are uh, in sustainability for us now, um, what I think the current corporate culture is in sustainability in Canada, and maybe just talk about some of the, some of the projects that we have uh, underway um, right now. Um, I like to tell, tell stories, and hopefully that makes it a little more interesting for all of you. And uh, the story I want to tell is a story about the beginning. Um, how did RealPAC get into this? Um, and um, what have we done with our original motivation going forward? A bit of a side light, uh, RealPAC is a 50-year-old trade association of the biggest real estate companies in Canada. Pretty much every pension fund, pretty much every TSX-listed real estate company and REIT um, PSPC, Infrastructure Ontario, some large private companies, all the banks, all the life codes, uh, all the large fund managers. Uh, so call it institutional real estate. Professional real estate is maybe another term that you could use to describe uh, our membership. Um, my experience really reflects our outlook. We're global. Um, we have global relationships. We like to stay in touch with global institutions, particularly as it affects real estate and investment. Uh, we believe in global standards uh, and we believe in global change. Um, our journey in sustainability started um, in September of 2006. Those of you scratching your heads and saying, well, what happened in September 2006? What happened was Michael was dropping his daughter off at Western University and saw this portable sign on the side of the road that said, now playing in the student theater, an inconvenient truth. An inconvenient truth, obviously Al Gore's uh, entry into this space um, really was transformational because it shocked me. It, it shocked me and embarrassed me. It embarrassed me because I realized I'd missed something on the far horizon coming at real estate, and that's my job. My job is to look out to the far horizon and um, try to anticipate what's going to impact real estate and how it's going to impact it. And uh, those of you who are of a certain age will remember, you know, the Al Gore years um, and will remember uh, Live Aid in 2007. I love these giant concerts with great musicians that do it for free and have a global audience. And Live Aid. Um, was huge back then and um, a lot of signature performances, but it brought that issue of sustainability to the world, a global consciousness. Uh, and that got us doing what we do at RealPAC, which is researching it. 
So uh, what do you do when you want to research something? You go to Google. So I started to Google, best real estate company in the world. And if you Googled that, you would be directed to some global certifications like um, the Dow Jones World Sustainability Index or FTSE for Good. Or, um, you know, these are um, stock market based indicators of leading companies that are voted on. So I did that in 2007, um, including Carbon Disclosure Project, their Climate Leadership Index. Um, and even there was an IPD index, which uh, way back then, which was um, an earlier iteration now owned by MSCI. So on the Global 100 Index, give you an example, there were four real estate companies in that. Three Europeans, one Australian company, zero from North America. On the Carbon Disclosure Project, there were three real estate companies on that list, all from Australia. Okay, I'm going down the list. I'm thinking, God, this has got to be better. Uh, Dow Jones World Sustainability Index had 13 real estate companies on that list. Seven from Europe, four from Australia, two from Japan. Yes, another shutout for North America. Really, are real estate companies that bad? I'm thinking to myself in 2007. And um, what do I do to bring our industry up? How can I bring our industry up? so that we can compete with the Europeans and we can compete with the Australians. Um, given the uh, prevalence of the Australians on the index, uh, first thing I did was go to Australia. What's so great about Australia? I'm going there. I went to see the CEOs. I went to see the directors of sustainability. I remember landing in Sydney and I'm groggy and I decide, you know what, I think I'm going to go down to see Bondi Beach where my little brother says it's fantastic and you can take a bus, go to Bondi Beach. And what's going on in Bondi Beach? But they have a water saving um, equipment uh, fair, 30 tents, just with water saving stuff. They were going through a drought at the time. Some of those technologies I still have not seen in Canada. And I'm talking to the um, sustainability directors. Remember, in early 2007, we had zero people in Canada with that title, working for a major real estate company, zero people. And um, towards some of those projects, um, one of the ones that is more, most interesting was the new city hall for Melbourne called Council House 2. I went and had a tour of that building. Um, yeah, they had gray water recycling, they had low energy consumption, didn't have solar panels back then, um, but they were processing black water. I'm not gonna describe what black water is, but you all know what black water is. They were pulling it out of a local pa passing sanitary sewer, processing it in the building and using it for gray water applications. I mean, I'm just shaking my head about how far ahead they were on so many initiatives. So um, we came back to Canada. Uh, I brought a sample green lease with me from Australia. Um, I know my Australian counterpart and I got back from him their beginner's guide to corporate social responsibility, brought that back to Canada. And uh, we started to work with, get to work with our community. Um, and given the fact that leases are, are long lived, you know, they're five, 10 years, um, I figured that's gotta be project one for me and for us because I gotta change that at the front end, otherwise we won't have an opportunity for another five or 10 years to really change these leases. So we started that in 2007. We started the ESG committee in later 2008. The first person with the name sustainability in their title was in January 2008 and that was Daryl Need of Oxford Properties. That's 12 years ago. First time anybody in Canada with that title in their name. Now our ESG committee, which Chris Kolink, who was on this call, uh, runs for RealPAC. Um, it's our biggest committee. We have 60 to 65 people around the table and on the phone uh, when we have meetings. Um, so clearly uh, most of the big landlords now will have one, if not a team of three, four or five people all doing sustainability. Um, when it comes to electricity and carbon, um, we decided that we weren't happy. Energy Star was not in Canada in 2007, 2008, 2009. 
I believe we got Energy Star in Canada around, uh, that's portfolio manager, around 2011, 2012. So we started our own um, normalized energy consumption methodology, uh, got together representatives from um, many of the, well, BOMA, uh, and we got a representative together um, from one of our other professional advisory groups. And we did our own normalization methodology, kind of the thing that you might see inside the black box of Energy Star. Built our own, got the Canada Green Building Council and uh, BOMA together and announced a targeted energy program for buildings called 20 by 15. 20 being the energy consumption, 20 equivalent kilowatt hours a square foot a year by the year 2015. Um, I probably didn't do the best job of socializing my industry before announcing that, and I have the scars in my back to prove it, but I can tell you that it shocked the industry. My analogy was Alice in Wonderland. If you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. And after looking at all these disparate um, targets with beginning year, end year, and targets, I really felt that our industry should have an achievable target, 20 equivalent kilowatt hours per square foot per year by the year 2015. And we rolled that program out and uh, collected data from our members. And actually, Chris was involved in doing the wrap-up report when we finished that in 2015. We didn't think it was needed to continue that because Energy Star uh, was being used. It was the base for Canada Green Building Council's LEED standards and uh, available, supported by the Government of Canada, great program, consistent with the US, so uh, didn't need to continue our program. But uh, we were the first to do that. Um, and as many of you will know, uh, certainly on the um, asset level, as far as buildings are concerned, we have the Canada Green Building Council doing great work in that space, uh, net zero carbon standards. We have BOMA also doing great work in that space with their BOMA Best program and their evolving uh, net zero standards. There's a, several of these around the world that we can have a look at. Um, so we've been spending a little more time moving upstream to the owner level. Uh, and to the investor level. And this is where we got into um, what was formerly called CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility, now better known as ESG, Environment, Social, and Governance. And Environment, Social, and Governance um, has grown in prominence, um, I think in real estate primarily due to the global prevalence um, of GRESP. And for those on the phone who don't know, real estate community in Canada, really around the world, certainly the bigger institutional real estate community, um, reports up to a platform called the Global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmark. And the benefit of GRESP over, say, just a reporting or a disclosure platform is that it allows you to compare yourself against your peers around the world. So GRESP, as it's known, um, is now owned by GBCI, which is the U.S. Green Building Council. Uh, so it's owned by a not-for-profit. Um, it is the de facto standard, I would say, globally amongst real estate firms in terms of reporting and comparing yourself to what's going on. Um, but there are obviously other players now in that space. Um, many of you will think back to 2015 and Mark Carney, when he was then governor of the Bank of England, announcing his task force on climate-related financial disclosures, TCFD for short. Um, and uh, Chris Kolink, of, uh, our uh, manager of sustainability and research, has been monitoring that program. We monitor science-based targets uh, and the emergence of that program. And indeed, there's just a plethora of new standards around the world. Uh, UN Principles of Responsible Investing, the Carbon Disclosure Project still, um, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, and then Sustainalytics has merged with Morningstar. MSCI has got their own platform. It's getting to be a crowded field in that turf. But it all boils down to what are you doing for the environment? What are you doing for your stakeholders and your people? And what's your governance like internally? And that's why we have continued to monitor ESG and promote that amongst our members. Um, 
year over year. And uh, more and more of our members every year participate in GRESB or do their own ESG report uh, at one level or another. One of the interesting things that, that we have found um, over the years is how the sophistication level has grown in our industry. So the goal of uh, the early sustainability managers in 2009, 2010 would have been, hey, yeah, save me some energy costs and your criteria is shortest payback period first. So that led to lighting retrofits being generally the number one, the, the low hanging fruit for the sustainability manager. Gather the data on consumption, try to figure out where the maximum burn is, what time of day or night it is, figure out where it's coming from and figure out how you can improve it so that it consumes less energy. So payback period was long uh, number one. Um, tenant attraction and retention um, was number two. Number three was the anticipated financial returns of you making the sustainability initiative. And we surveyed that, uh, myself and Professor Jennifer MacArthur of Ryerson surveyed that over three time periods, 2006 to 2012, 12 to 18 and 18 looking forward. And it's been interesting to see how the sustainability managers have changed their attitude towards the criteria they use to evaluate energy saving initiatives. So maybe number one was payback period, but now it's brand. If you're a big institutional real estate company, you wanna be known as a good citizen. You wanna be known as running a good building you want to be known as running an efficient building because you need that to attract the kind of tenants that you want. And for most of the bigger tenants, they want to know. They want to know how does your building perform. So brand is number one. Number two, it's tightly related to brand is anticipated financial returns. If I have a leading building, I will attract better tenants who will pay me good rent to be in my building and therefore I will be successful. Payback period slipped to number three on the radar. Um, and there are many, various other criteria that are secondary thoughts uh, in the mindset of most of the owners, but that's been very interesting. And certainly the biggest of the members um, are very sophisticated in managing their energy consumption, now carbon consumption, uh, disclosing it now in Ontario under the EWRB uh, program uh, and, in, and in British Columbia. And I believe that will grow as we go forward. So then we get to carbon. Um, I like to check on carbon every few months. I go to the Mauna Loa website in Hawaii. It's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean gives you a pretty unbiased historical view. They have great data set going back. And you, and you can just see this sawtooth. It's like taking a handsaw and then turning it 45 degrees. That's what the Mauna Loa increase in CO2 on the planet looks like. We are at 416 parts per million in CO2 and we're climbing. We know we have been largely unable to arrest the growth during this pandemic because we're down, what, 6% is the number I've seen? Only 6% and none of us are driving to work. Where's the other 94% coming from? And how do we get a handle on that? I think the fugitive methane problem, we are focusing on more and more as a nation and focusing on more and more on the regulatory side. Uh, we do need to find that and we do need to curb that going forward. Globally, buildings account for just over 18% of greenhouse gas emissions, that's 2014 data. Um, in 2017 in Canada, uh, according to the federal government, we're around 12% of GHD emissions. So we are a part of the problem. We can be part of the solution uh, and we need to keep moving forward, uh, but we also need to have some solutions at the macro level. 
I think some of that is um, is really utilities um, and what the utilities are doing to get off of coal and to get back to um, cleaner sources of energy. So um, on carbon, we're coming at it from the both the low carbon buildings position and the low electricity consumption uh, point of view. But we're also focused on water as a, as a trade association, uh, black, gray, and wild water, waste and recycling, health within structures, and even more recently, supply chain issues. The water piece has been a particular focus uh, this past year for us because we've had so many floods. We've had so many overland downpour floods. I've never been, and I work downtown in the core of the city of Toronto, I've never been in the concourse in the city of Toronto where it's gone dark, and it did in August of 18. So much water from a downpour. You've all seen those photos of uh, some lawyer in a Porsche who had to leave it in the bottom of uh, the underpass on Simcoe Street because of one of the downpours. I believe that was August 17. These will continue and they'll get worse. And buildings aren't built for them. We have open grates on the sidewalks or in the bottom panel of buildings that lead to the transformer room. When we have a downpour of water, it goes in those grates into the transformer room and shorts up the transformer. We've got a lot of work to do about resilience of our buildings. And um, a lot of our members are starting to do that now. Um, maybe the leader in this space, I still think maybe it's a leader in Canada is Ivanhoe Cambridge, um, who have accessed um, two sources of global data on hazard. This is heat, cold, wind, earthquake, fire, um, 14 indicators. And they've looked at the applicability of those risks to each of their assets around the world. This is a major undertaking using the Swiss Re data set and using, I believe, the Maplecroft data set. Um, and have really ended up at a value at risk metric for their portfolio globally. Um, MSCI recently bought a global private company called Carbon Delta, and they are also looking to roll out uh, through their platform an analysis tool for owners of buildings where they can assess their value at risk. So what's your building worth and what would it be worth if it got flooded or is it susceptible to wildfire or a river flood? or extreme heat or extreme cold. So this is a major project for Chris and I um, in the past year. Um, waste continues to vex us, particularly recycling. Um, we know there's cross-contamination in recycling. Um, it's a behavioral issue as much as anything else. I don't know that we've really solved that puzzle yet, especially in food courts. Um, it is a focus for many of our members to try to figure that out. And then maybe uh, health within structures. If I could finish with health within structures, because that will kind of lead us into maybe a COVID, a, a COVID discussion. So the health and wellness movement has been part of the S of ESG for several years. Uh, many of you might be aware of the WELL standard, W-E-L-L, -L, which is kind of a health and wellness standard applied to a building level. Um, FitWell is another initiative similar to WELL that comes out of the U.S. Center for Disease Control. It's a nonprofit. Many of our members have buildings that have adopted a WELL or a FitWell standard. But we're almost morphing now into another phase of buildings, the disease-resistant building. What is a disease-resistant building? What does it look like? Is it surfaces? Is it surface materials that are inhospitable to viruses? Is it just procedures, um, enhanced cleaning, um, different kinds of elevators, um, greater use of stairs? Um, this is uh, an issue that's 10 weeks old that our members are starting to think about now. And it's part of this return to work initiative. Um, and it's part of the, how do I uh, get my employees comfortable to come back to the office to work, or do I even want to do that? Many of you will see Shopify announced, hey, you know what, all of our people are going to work from home. 
till the end of 2021. Open text said the same thing. BMO, I think, said 80% of the people might work from home. So um, now we have a behavioral issue that's also impacting how we run buildings and how do we effectively manage that. And I'm sure that we'll be doing more work in that. Chris and his colleagues in, in our shop have already started a big bibliography and research initiative around that space. So um, I would maybe stop there and just say there's so many projects and so many worthy initiatives for us to chase up. Um, <clears throat> it's good to spread the load a little bit. It's good to see CAGBC, BOMA Canada, taking more on the asset level um, and letting us do more in the ESG and the investor level. But uh, there's a long way to go. There's a long way to go on carbon reduction and moving the needle there. There's a long way to go on energy efficiency in buildings and moving the needle there. There's a long way to go on waste reduction and recycling and water use reduction, frankly. So maybe with that, um, I'll stop there. It's one o'clock and we can have some, uh, some time for Q&A. Maybe I'll turn it back to uh, Evan, if you wanna be the moderator or is there some on the chat line maybe? Michael just had to unmute there. Yeah, um, I don't think we have too many questions in the chat right now. So uh, what we can do is uh, open up a little bit here. If anyone has a question that they want to ask Michael directly, um, just send us a quick message. We can unmute you and you can ask. Um, as people are sort of sorting that out, um, I had a quick question for you, Michael, that just might be relevant to some Carbon 613 members. Um, you talked a lot about, obviously, the benefits to uh, companies in having a, a more sustainability standard for their, for their building. Do you have any advice for businesses or organizations that are currently leasing space in a building who want to make maybe a stronger sustainability case to their current landlords or, or building owner? Yeah, I make a couple of points uh, on that. Um, <clears throat> Many of the larger landlords have uh, tenant committees. Uh, I know in our building, we're in the TD Center in Toronto, it's Cadillac Fairview building. Um, they have a tenant committee and that's one way to voice concern. Um, another way is to um, see if you can engage uh, directly with the leasing managers uh, and, and uh, push a little more uh, in terms of what you'd like to see in the building. Um, the leasing managers, want to move you into a building and once you're there they at least the in-house ones want to keep you there and so if you can start asking questions about what's the building performance what can you tell me about our energy performance how does it relate do you submit to gresb how are you guys rated on the gresb platform do you submit to carbon disclosure project uh, what's the carbon output of this building are you participating in ewrb all these kinds of questions um, are likely to get you a lot more detail so um, I think that any tenant, large or small, can do all of those things. You might end up being underwhelmed with your performance. You might be impressed with what's going on behind the scenes. Um, I do think there is a general bias. The larger landlords who can hire people will generally be better at that. That maybe it's an overgeneralization, but they will generally be better at that because they got the people and the scale to address the issue, whereas some of the smaller landlords may not have the resources to, uh, to adequately uh, do all of these data gathering and follow up on all these initiatives. So that's what I would say on that. Great, thank you. That was a great answer. Um, some good notes to take for some of our Carbon 613 members. Now, is there anyone else in the, uh, in the call right now who has any questions for Michael or any other input that they'd like to share? Sure. Hey, Michael. I hope you are well in Toronto and self-isolating. Uh, by the way, it looks like a really nice office there. I've been trying to live, uh, zoom in to see what your reading is on your bookshelf there. Uh, <laughs> I got a you know, question for you. When we, say, when we look at the COVID-19, you know, uh, and we're talking about the return to work, and yeah, certain corporations, the Googles of the world, the open decks of the world, they've kind of taken a position on this. But you know, are building owners getting ready for the return to work? You know, when we start to look at, you know, the extra cleaning, uh, you know, changing services, 
And I think the one thing that really baffles me are how are we gonna actually manage the elevators, right? You take a million square foot building, you know, and, and you got you know, 5,000 people there, you know, uh, you know, how's everybody gonna get up, you know, into the building kind of thing. Are we ready? Um, you've hit one nail on the head. I'll talk about the elevator issue. And um, it's, it's unsolvable. Uh, you're absolutely right. If 50% if or more of the inhabitants of a building came to work and were only letting two at a time in the elevator, um, you know, you'd have a two hour wait, uh, potentially, just to get up to your floor, depending on the, you know, your million square foot building. Sure. So um, owners are gonna have to figure that out and they're certainly gonna have to um, think about whether they want to mandate, you must wear a mask in the elevator. Uh, I have heard suggestions that one major landlord will have that requirement. Uh, I heard that this morning. Um, so I think everybody is thinking about that and it's troubled by that. And look, the reality is that buildings aren't completely designed for social distancing permanently. Yeah. So it, it's a great question. As to how, what they're, whether they're ready generally, they've all been working on it very diligently for over a month. We are having sector calls uh, within RealPAC, um, every land use sector, seniors, hotel, office, retail, industrial, uh, multifamily. We've been having them weekly uh, to start, and now these are spreading out to every two or three weeks. Um, it's funny how the conversation morphs into hey, how are you guys doing your back to work strategy uh, for your own staffs? And what are you thinking about? Uh, the office building owners particularly have been focused on this issue and we've had some really interesting discussions. Um, one of the discussions that I was on was about whether we're gonna do temperature checks in the lobbies. So is someone gonna stand there with a temperature gun and shoot you in the forehead and check your temperature every day? Um, I think that's probably going to come down on the no side. I think it's false, it's false assurance, given that people can be asymptomatic. Sure. Um, I think that there'll be most landlords who will require their own service staff in buildings to wear masks for yeah. the comfort uh, and assurance of tenants. Um, otherwise, I think a lot of the protections are going to have to come from the tenants as employers themselves. So it's what do they require once you get inside their lobby door uh, in terms of interaction with their staffs. So it's evolving. As I said, we're building a bibliography uh, of this. Um, I believe that BOMA Canada has come out with a uh, preliminary guide in the last few days, uh, or maybe, a, maybe in the last week, uh, available on the BOMA Canada website about return to work, uh, but it, it's a moving target uh, to me. And there are so many other credible parties weighing in on this. The Center for Disease Control also released a back to work publication a couple of weeks ago. Uh, anybody you can think of who has credibility in this space has some kind of a guide. So um, even the brokerages, even the brokerages are, you know, Cushman's yeah. released something and, yeah. Colliers has something, so it's it's um, pretty common. Thanks, James. Yeah, yeah, well, great thank question. You. Thank you, James. Um, we do have a couple in the chat now, so uh, maybe I'll read uh, one of them out uh, for you, Michael. Um, Marcel has asked. Uh, well, first he said, "Thank you for sharing insights." Um, and he's. It seems that COVID is pushing forward the social aspects of ESG considerations rather than the more traditional environmental focus. Do you also perceive such a shift and how do you envision those consequences for yourself as well as for your members' sustainability practices? That is a great question. Um, we've actually, uh, to mention Chris Kolink of our shop is on the line, we've actually been focused a little more on the S than the E um, in the past a uh, year and a half, two years. Um, we've had a pretty strong diversity and inclusiveness initiative underway at RealPAC to try to transform the industry to make it more welcoming for diverse groups and not just you know, white guys like me. Um, but out of that social piece um, comes the health piece as well. <clears throat> the mental health piece I think has been 
one of the ones most strongly represented on social media about, look, it's okay to be having a bad day. It's okay not to feel well. Um, and to be a little more tolerant uh, of people in those situations. <clears throat> Similarly with COVID, um, we're surveying our staff. I think most of our members are also surveying their staffs. How comfortable are you returning to the office? Under what conditions would you? How comfortable are you taking public transit? How would you change the way you get to work if you wanted to come to work? Um, and those results are all over the map. One anecdote I'll share with you um, from one of our members on a call just under a week ago. He has a global portfolio of assets. Georgia has lifted restrictions. You can go back to work in Atlanta, Georgia. He owns a major office building in Atlanta, Georgia. Zero people came back to work the first week after they opened it up. Why? Because Georgia hasn't contained the virus and people do not have the confidence that they're safe going back to work in Georgia. Contrast that with the story, same person telling us the story about their office building in Singapore and Kowloon, China. We know that China arrested the growth of their cases very early, even though they have flare-ups to be expected. Um, <clears throat> and Singapore was very aggressive early. They've had flare-ups as well. They were back to almost full occupancy. Singapore, Kowloon office buildings. That's incredible <laughs> variation, zero to 100. How do you explain that? confidence and fear. And that's the unknown here. Um, you know, if I think about myself personally, am I nervous to go back downtown? Um, I think I can be careful. I don't want to touch any surfaces. I'm going to wash my hands like crazy. Yes, I'll wear a mask in the path system or wear them around people that I can't social distance from. Uh, but do I really want to drive versus take the go train? That's not a good thing for the environment either, but that is a solution for many people who formerly would have taken public transit. They will now choose to drive. And a lot of our members are talking about that uh, as well. That's not a good, a good result of this, but maybe it's short term only. So I think we're all troubled by this. We're all troubled by this question of when, how, how fearful will I be? Um, do I think it's safe? And to my employer and my landlord, what can you do to assure me that it's low risk for me to come back to the office? That's the open question. That's a great question and a great answer. Thank you, Michael and Marcel. Um, I've got another question in the chat here as well. Um, apart from leasing documents and any official and binding documents, how would you instill a lasting culture of sustainability within buildings? Um, yeah, it's certainly not, not the legal agreements. Um, and it, it is very much behavioral. Um, I think some of that is just engagement and communication. Um, if you can get people to believe in a shared goal, What's our shared goal? Uh, our shared goal, and this is a strategy that you've noticed that GBCI, the Green Building Council in the US has adopted. They've made green, green buildings and even low carbon synonymous with health. So instead of this invisible monster CO2 and demonizing this invisible monster CO2, Let's internalize this and make this conversation about your health, about air quality, about asthma, about your food supply, uh, all of those elements around it. And I think that that is a communication task for all of us. And I actually do like that subtle shift in messaging from the US Green Building Council uh, and Canada Green Building Council for that matter, 
um, because um, I think that resonates with more people if you can bring it down to a personal level, as opposed to some invisible gas that no one sees. That's great. Thanks again. So that's all the questions that we have in the chat right now. So if anyone else has any questions, uh, follow up questions or wants to add to anything, um, feel free, uh, put your hand up now or, or jump into the chat, take yourself off mute. Looks like James uh, has something to say. So we'll switch over to him. Hey, Michael again. Uh, there's been a lot of articles written and a lot of discussion about, you know, the COVID-19 being a opportunity, okay, to be able to change our ways and address climate change. What are you seeing out there when you see the, uh, uh, you know, the, the Hawaii, you know, like our, you know, carbon really hasn't gone down, you know, significant. I was just looking at it. It's only 2% today, you know, on that as compared to last year, you know, like, is this a true opportunity to rethink how we deal with our day-to-day -day lives? Yeah. <clears throat> um, I do believe it is, and it's heartening to see uh, all of the commentary about um, building back better is one phrase that I hear. Um, the Green New Deal. The Green New Deal kind of floated around in US politics, but it's mm -hmm. interesting how now more world leaders, when they talk about uh, post-pandemic stimulus, they're talking about green initiatives. No one's talking about building a new coal plant to keep people employed uh, coming out of this. Um, so even in Canada, I have a call this afternoon with my CEOs and one of the things on the agenda is, what's our restarting the economy plan? What would we recommend as an industry to government um, to move us forward? Hey, you know, maybe that is you want to spend money to get people employed. How about retrofitting buildings? How about putting a bunch of money towards that? Let's get our, our bad buildings up to snuff. Um, energy saving improvements, energy saving initiatives, um, district heating. I mean, there's so many other initiatives um, that we could, we could have to give us a green fresh start. Um, I think that's where governments should go, and we have this unique opportunity uh, coming out of this to to restart on a better footing than we went into this on. It's a good point, James. Thanks for that. Thank you. Yes, thanks, James. Uh, I've been reading a lot too about the sort of green recovery and what that looks like. Um, if anybody's looking for sort of more information or a few different perspectives, uh, you can check the Carbon 613 newsletter. The last two issues have had a few links to uh, opinion pieces and articles about uh, that green recovery and what that might look like here uh, in Canada and Ottawa and abroad. Um, so thanks, very enlightening question. Um, is there anyone else in the audience who has any questions for James? Uh, I am conscious we are coming towards the end of the hour, so uh, feel free to get some in now. Um, give everyone a minute maybe in case anyone thinks of anything. Well, I did just throw maybe something a little bit out there, but I think it's relevant to this. What's your thoughts, Michael, on valuations as we go forward? Are vacancy level levels going to spike? Are we going to end up with, you know, kind of a mid 90s situation within the real estate again? You know, like when we start to talk about these big corporations staying from home, you know, is there a potential we'll end up mothballing a bunch of buildings? And I'll extend that to, to say, hey, you know, here's the opportunity, okay, to do those green retrofits in order to bring these buildings to more of a modern standard. Like, I don't necessarily think from a climate change standpoint, it's a bad thing if we spike it. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I think uh, if you'd asked me that four weeks ago, I would have said, yeah, I think, I think there's going to be a lot of, a lot of uh, companies that decide this work from home thing makes a lot of sense. They've discovered Sure. that they can be just as productive with a workforce that's working from home. Um, you know, they can have their Zoom meetings and uh, people are still working. Uh, but then I started to see the, the bad side of it. People actually working harder. You know, what was usually commute downtime is now work time. Um, I'm working harder than I've ever worked. It's just, there's just so much going on, but I have to. But um, 
so there's there's that. Um, for many people, it's just um, it doesn't work working from home. They've got pets or they've got kids or their spouse is working and they're both in separate rooms and you know trying to communicate. It's not a professional environment. Um, for, in our shop, I, I, we we made a little budget for people, five hundred bucks to go and outfit your home office, buy yourself a chair if you don't have one, buy a table if you don't have one, just do something to help yourself be a little more productive. Uh, but still, it's not just, it's not like an office environment. Um, so Wendy Waters of GWL actually had a really good article that she tweeted about yesterday. Um, and um, I think she's on to something. I think that um, office is here to stay. Uh, I, th I think people will be fearful until they're comfortable coming back to the office and figuring out that how do I get their peace uh, and being safe. Um, I think that's, that these, these cubicle villages where they've crammed, densified the offices, I think that will reverse. Uh, I, I just don't think you can make that work. Um, and um, I was kind of criticized when RealPack moved into our offices six years ago because everybody's got an individual office with a door that closes. And, and you know, they're reasonably sized. I'm not sure, James, you've been to our shop or not. Um, a new one. Because I was under some pressure just to open plan and put everybody in little cubicles and stuff. And uh, I, you know, I asked my staff and they, you know what, I, they'd rather have a place they can close the door. Now it looks like we have the right office environment because you can go in the office and close your door. And if someone sneezes two cubicles over, it doesn't waft over you, you know, while you're trying to do your work. Uh, so um, I'm of the view that offices are here to stay. Um, will, it, would, will it be 100% occupied or will it drop, uh, you know, 5 or 10%? It could, uh, but it's not dropping 50%. Okay. So you'll still have work to do, James. Yeah, perfect. That's what we like. <laughs> Awful quiet right now. If you need a hand with anything, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That is uh, also really interesting. Um, yeah. As we sort of get to our last little bit here, um, I'm conscious uh, that there's no more questions in the chat. So leaving it open again to see if anyone uh, has come up with anything uh, after James there. And uh, if not, then I can thank everybody. So we'll just give it a 30 seconds or so. I don't see anyone else with any video on or, or unmuted, so I assume no one else has any questions right now. I want to thank you, James, for uh, coming on here and, and speaking, uh, or sorry, James, for your questions, and Michael for coming on and speaking to the audience. Um, I, I found this really interesting. I've taken some notes here to uh, share with some specific members that I have in mind, some of the information you've shared. Um, if there uh, is anyone who's more in interested in learning more about Carbon 613, we'll be sending out a follow-up email with some more information, some links you can follow. I encourage everyone to sign up for the Carbon 613 newsletter uh, so you can hear about more virtual speaker series like this uh, and other events that we are either hosting ourselves or connected with across the province from other hubs. So uh, take a look on there. Um, lots of great discussions happening around uh, sustainability and the green recovery and, and what uh, all this means. Um, so without... Uh, Further ado, thanks again, Michael, and uh, we can end the meeting and then send out that follow-up to everybody. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank, thank you, Michael. Michael. Thanks, thank everyone. you, uh, all Environment Center team for putting this together. It was really informative. Thanks. Thanks, James. Thanks, James. Great to have you. Take care, everyone. Bye, folks.